All right, well, before we get started, while everyone is um, finding their seats, I want to mention one more thing um, that I didn't mention to Victoria, and that is uh, Testimony Sundays that we're going to be implementing. So in October, the very last Sunday in October, along with Soup Sunday, we will also be doing a Testimony Sunday. So we don't want just kind of the usual suspects up here all the time. We want to hear from the entire community about God's activity, what he's doing in your life, what he's done for you and actually through you, ways that you've seen the kingdom come um, and the power of God come through you and your obedience to God. And so this is something we want to do because it's going to help build our faith. It's going to help connect us um, together and just build up the body of Christ. So um, I encourage everyone to be bold in this um, and to not be afraid to share because this is something that, that is going to build us up and be helpful for everyone. So if you have a testimony you want to share, would you please, because we want to do it in an orderly way with some structure, would you please um, tell one of our elders? So you could come to Michael and Trudy or Vic and Irene or Ed and Elaine um, or Jeff and myself. And just let us know, and then we'll kind of get you on the roster for Testimony Sunday. And we need, we need, we want this to work. So you got to be bold, and even if you're a little bit nervous and sharing, just to push through that, and um, so that we get to hear from everyone in the community. Okay. So today is a new series, and I know I say this every time, but I'm excited, and I only say that because it's true. Because I believe in the word of God and the power of God um, as he speaks through his word to come and, and transform us. And so I really believe that there are going to be strongholds uh, broken and lies just torn away throughout this series as we journey through it over the next few months. So this series is called Crowned and Commissioned, as we have heard, living in our identity and living it out. So we're going to be focusing on who we are in Christ and walking in the identity that he has bestowed upon us so that we can make an impact in this world and bring the kingdom. We have been crowned with an identity and we have also been commissioned to bring the kingdom to this world. And so the people of God have indeed been uh, given this identity so that we can flourish right, for our freedom, so that we can experience the goodness and the power and the love of God. But it is also, it is not just for ourselves, it is also so that we would bring the kingdom and transformation to this world, that what we experience of God, we also share with those around us. We have been crowned and we have been commissioned, been given a mission sent out to bring the kingdom so that the knowledge and the glory of God would fill the earth, so that others would encounter the reality of God. So identity is not really about um, who I am as an individual. It's not about individualism and my personality and my character. Though those are important, we all have our own uniqueness that we bring into the kingdom. Identity is a little different than that. The definition of identity is the state of being exactly alike. Identity actually means sameness. So think of your identity card. When you show it, someone wants to see your ID and make sure this is the same person as you. If your ID is stolen, someone is pretending to be you, to be the same person as you. So identity means sameness. So having our identity in Christ means having the sameness of Christ. It means being like him. As John says in his letter to the church, in this world we are like Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. Or the message translation says, our standing in this world is identical with Christ's. Our identity linked to Christ being the same as he. And so first of all, if we want to know who we are, we have to know 
who he is, right? We've got to look to him. We've got to see him. We have to have Jesus revealed if we want to know who we are in him and our identity. And so the book of Revelation is, in my opinion, the most beautiful book of the scriptures that reveals the magnitude of who Jesus is. It is called the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ where it reveals who he is to his church. And in 19.12, in verse 12, it says, His eyes burn like a flaming fire, and on his head are many crowns. And there on his robe and on his thigh was written his name, King of kings and Lord of lords. Here we see Jesus. He is the king who wears many crowns. He is king of kings and lord of lords. He has been revealed. He is high above all powers, rulers, and authorities. Now we know that we are not Christ himself, right? He is utterly unique. There is no one else who holds the title king of kings and lord of lords. And we worship him because that's who he is. But to all who proclaim him as king, to all who make him lord of their lives, he does bestow a crown. He does give an identity to be like him. This is the meaning of being in Christ. As he is, so are we in this world. And now if we want to live like Jesus in this world, because that is what we've been commissioned to do, We've got to know who we are. We've got to know who we are. We've got to know our identity in him. We've got to know what the crown means. We've got to know what it looks like, what it feels like, what it means to walk in it and bring his kingdom to this earth. And so I really believe this series is going to be an important one. I believe God is going to shift our mindsets and open us up to the realization of who we are. Because when we know our identity in him, it keeps us moving forward into the things of God. If we don't know who we are, we're just kind of stagnant. We just kind of go around in circles, right? So Bruce Waukee, who is a uh, leading theologian in, in Old Testament theology, he talks a lot about identity, and he says, Our self-identity is the window through which we perceive and engage the world. It determines all that we do. How we understand ourselves dictates how we believe. So our identity determines how we interact with others. He quotes uh, Emil Brunner, who is a theologian from, you know, the early 20th century, who says, the most powerful of all spiritual forces is man's view of himself, the way in which he understands his nature and destiny. Indeed, it is the one force which determines all the others which influence human life. Here he's speaking of identity as being a spiritual force. Our identities are a force in this world for good or for bad. What we believe to be true about ourselves will dictate the course of our lives. But it will also impact those around us. Because whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, our lives do make an impact. For better or for worse, our lives have this ripple effect. And so what we believe about ourselves spills out onto this world. What we walk in is uh, in our identity just leaks out of us. So here's the question this morning. What do you believe to be true about yourself? How does or how will your life make an impact on those around you? See, there are two questions that humanity has been asking since the beginning, since the fall, for thousands and thousands, thousands of years. Who am I? And what is my purpose? In fact, there is an all-out obsession in our culture to determine one's identity. 
and to find a place in this world. We kind of walk around with this gnawing feeling in the depths of our soul, like this hole that longs to be filled, this this thing inside us that cries out, who am I? Who am I? And so there's just this obsession with finding identity. And the, the pursuit of identity has many different avenues. There's lots of places that people can go in search of their identity to soothe that sort of hole inside. Maybe it's found in career. Maybe it's found in physical appearance. Maybe it's found in my financial status or in my influence or in my achievements. Maybe I'll find who I am in my talents or my giftings. One right now in our culture, for, especially for young people, is trying to find identity in sexual orientation. Maybe I'll find it over here with this group. Maybe that's who I am. Another big one is uh, identifying ourselves through a political party and our ideologies. I identify with this group over here. Yeah, that's who I am. Or I'm over here with this ruler or this leader. I identify with them. So this search, which one, which one will soothe that, that gnawing sensation? Or maybe it's this one. Pick one from the list. I'll grab hold of this one. And so we do that and then and then we attach ourselves to it, like it belongs to us, like it is part of, of us. And then eventually, that thing will fail, it will fall. Um, this sexual orientation isn't working for me anymore. This political party isn't working for me. This ruler, this leader, um, my looks have failed me. I have lost my wealth, I have lost my influence. I can no longer operate in these talents or giftings because you know, maybe I, because of physical illness, all these things that we attach ourselves to will eventually fail us. And when they do, we become lost all over again. And we don't know who we are, and we end up back in this endless pursuit of identity. Now, it is obvious that this world is having an identity crisis. You just have to walk out your front door. We can see it in this city. People don't know who they are and they're searching. And we can point the finger, which we often do, and say, yes, that's the problem. They have the problem. They are the problem. But what if we pause? What if we just stop long enough and take that finger and turn it around? And what if we ask ourselves, who am I? And I don't want you to answer that right now. Don't come up with an answer. Don't try and come up with something that sounds good and right. But really sit with it. Sit with ourselves long enough. Detach ourselves from the external and ask, who am I? I would encourage all of us to connect with that deepest longing inside of us, to sit with ourselves this week, to put aside distractions, to enter into silence and solitude long enough to sit with that question, who am I? See what comes up. Because it is the most important question it is, and it must be answered. It must be answered, because if it is not, we will go round and round and round, and we will never know our place in this world. And we will attach ourselves to things that will fail us. It's a question that must be answered so that our identity is not up for grabs anymore. As our life circumstances change, our identity remains. The matter must be settled in our hearts. And the good news is God has already answered this question. 
The good news is that God longs to settle this question for humanity, for you and for me. It's what he did at the start. He never meant for our identity to be up for grabs. The creator of all things gives humanity identity. He crowns them and he gives them purpose. He commissions them. And so we'll go to Genesis 1, to the very familiar story that we often visit. After God had created all things, the heavens and the earth, all things seen and unseen, it says that God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The definition of identity is on the first page of the Bible. In his image, to be like him. Uh, Humanity given this, this sameness as God. And then it says that the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. He breathed his nostri- into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. God's life, God's life force inside humanity, the man and the woman. We see here identity is meant to be connected to another. And that our identity, who we are, is joined, it's interconnected, it's inseparable from our creator. We cannot find our identity outside of the one who created us because we are connected to him, made to be the same as him. That question, who am I, will never be answered apart from God or outside of him. So God gives identity. You're the same as me. You look like me. And then he gives purpose, um, a way for humanity to make an impact through their God-given identity. So it says in verse 28, after he made them, that God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God says, see, all that I have made, I give it to you. Rule over it. Like as royalty, rule over the earth. And he says, be fruitful and multiply. This is... um, Kingdom expansion. Go and spread the goodness and the glory of God. This is what we have been commissioned to do from the beginning. Now, to give us a little context for um, the culture in which Genesis was written, when Moses wrote this book, in the ancient Near East, people would construct temples for their gods. And so every region, every area, every sort of parcel of land had its own god. So there were various gods. And when the temple was built, a king, uh, one man would be set in place to rule for that god, to represent the god, to do the will of that god, acting in that god's place. So here in Genesis, Moses is speaking into that culture, and he's showing that God made a temple of human hands, and it wasn't a building, but it was the entire earth, the heavens and the earth, and that he ruled over all of it, not just one region. That he is king who created the heavens and the earth. And then God makes an image, but not stone or wooden idols, and not one man in a temple, but all of humanity, both man and woman, and he says, rule. And so he crowns them. They are the crown of his creation. They are kings and queens, God's representatives on the earth, commissioned to bring the kingdom. Agents made in God's image. And so David is reflecting on this in Psalm 8. And he says, When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. He gives them a crown to live in and live out in the world. But then we see in Genesis that evil creeps in, right? The snake slithers onto the scene and begins to question the humans 
and doubt creeps in. Doubt about who God is and doubt about who they are. So in Genesis 3.1, the serpent comes and says, did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? Like, is that really God's will? Is that really what God has said? Is that who he is? And then the lie comes. God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the liar comes to steal identity. That is what he does. He comes to to make us question who we are and who God is. And so Satan says, you are not like God. You've got to step outside of what God said so that you can be like him. But God had already said, you are like me. You are exactly like me, made in my image. And so the humans question this because of the lie, and they believe it. And so sin enters. And sin is doing life apart from God. Sin is turning from God to do our own will and what we think is best. So sin enters the scene, death and darkness, and the enemy gets a foothold. And now the crown has fallen. And now humanity questions who they are because their identity has been stolen. And now they do not know their place in the world and and their purposes and what they've been called to. But God pursues, right? God chases them down, longing to restore this crown and his original purposes for humanity. And so we'll fast forward uh, to Exodus, and God gathers Israel. He pulls them out of darkness from the hands of the enemy, and he sets them up as a kingdom of his own. He says, you are my people, and I am your God. And then he gives them identity. He shows them who he is. And that they are to be like him in the world. That they are to represent him. That they are to bless the nations around them through this new identity that God had given them. And so we read about this in Ezekiel 16. Where God says to Israel, I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you and put ointments on you. I clothed you with an embroidered dress and put sandals of fine leather on you. I dressed you in fine linen and covered you with costly garments. I adorned you with jewelry. I put bracelets on your arms and a necklace around your neck. I put a ring on your nose, earrings on your ear, and a beautiful crown on your head. And so you were adorned with gold and silver, and you became very beautiful and rose to be a queen, and all your fame spread among the nations on account of your beauty, because the splendor I had given you made your beauty perfect, declares the sovereign Lord. We see here that God had given them a crown, that Israel had rose to power, that they were rulers over all the nations. But Israel did not use their crown the way that God intended them to. It goes on, and Ezekiel prophesies in the name of the Lord. And God says, but you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute. You lavished your favors on anyone who passed by, and your beauty became his. You also took the fine jewelry I gave you, the jewelry made of my gold and silver, and you made for yourself male idols and engaged in prostitution with them. Israel became like the nations around them. They took on the identity of the world, and they began to worship other gods. They followed the way of the world and not God's way. And they began to look for life outside of God, outside of who they were in him, outside of his purposes. The original sin that we read about in the garden, trying to do life apart from God, to have more, to be more. So Israel used their crown for their own advantages, for their own purposes, to exalt themselves. And because of this, the crown once again falls. As Jeremiah says in Lamentations, the crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. 
We have not done God's will in the world. We have done our own, and it has caused chaos and destruction. But God comes in with promise. Because for as many times that Israel falls, God pursues them with promise and injects hope. And he says this in Ezekiel, The crown will not be restored until he to whom it rightfully belongs shall come. To him I will give it. A crown will be restored, but not until he comes. Not until the one comes. And so the prophet Daniel, he sees this one, and he says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one, like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He was from heaven, but he was the son of man. Now the son of man is a title given to Jesus, and it means the human one. Son of man, human, humanity. That Jesus himself embodies all of humanity. He is the human one. And he represents what all of humanity could have been, should have been. And he stands in humanity's place because he is the human one. The son of man. But Daniel sees more and it says, He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So he sees the Son of Man. He is the human one. And he is also the exalted one. He is God himself. He reigns above all powers, rulers, and authority. And his kingdom will never end. So he is human and he is God and he is the king to whom the crown belongs. And this king, Jesus himself, he comes and he steps off his throne and he lays down his crown. As Paul talks about in Philippians, he had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave being human. Having become human, he stayed human. He was the human one. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, died a selfless, obedient death, and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. He laid down his crown, took on humanity, came for us, and he showed us what it means to truly be human to be made in the image of God, to have that identity. And then he shows us what God is like, because he is God. And he shows us what his kingdom is like and how the kingdom will cover the entire earth. And so he comes to restore our identity, to restore a crown, but he does this through suffering. And he does this through wearing a crown of thorns. And as the Son of Man, representing all humanity, he takes on our sin. He absorbs it, he takes it on to the cross, and then he dies. There is where he is exalted. There is the victory of God where the power of sin has been broken. He raises to life and he comes to his followers and he breathes his life uh, giving spirit back into his followers, remaking them, renewing them into the image of God, just as he did at the beginning. And so he conquers sin and death, and he ascends back on the throne above all things, and he bestows a crown on all of those who exalt him as king and lord of their lives. This is why the psalmist says, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your sins, heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He's pulled you from darkness, and he crowns you with love and compassion. And now we wear a crown of beauty instead of, a crown, uh, instead of ashes, right? And speaking of Christ's victory, uh, Zechariah says, of the cross. God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. So this, this crown, it speaks of our identity. And it is glorious. 
It is more glorious than we can ever imagine. But it is not for looks. The crown has purpose. The crown has power. Our identity in Christ is a spiritual force in this world. And we have been crowned, but we have also been commissioned to build and expand the kingdom on earth, to take our identity and walk in it. And as we do that, we see the kingdom come. And we do this the way that our king did it, the way that he lived his life. He shows us how we bring the kingdom and what the crown means. In John 13, it says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew exactly who he was. That question was not up for grabs. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus, being so secure in his identity and who he was in God, empowered him to serve in all humility and meekness. He didn't come to... um, for his own advantages and purposes. He came to serve. And so he says to them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. And now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Do as I have done. Bring the kingdom this way. Humble yourselves. Don't exalt yourselves. Serve those around you. The servant is not greater than the master, but we are here to serve. The messenger is not greater than the one who sent him, but we are here with a message and with some good news that God has come to answer this question, who am I for all humanity, for all those who are searching? This crown does not puff us up. It builds us up to operate the way that Jesus did in this world, to serve with humility and meekness. Knowing our identity empowers us to actually serve others in this world. And so we are given this crown, but it always points to the one who gives it, to the one to whom it rightfully belongs, the king of many crowns. And as you read about in Revelation, over and over again, we come to the feet of Jesus and we lay down our crowns at his feet to worship him, to glorify him, to say, Lord, your will be done, not my own to say, your kingdom come and not my own. In him alone will we find our identity and our purpose. It cannot be found anywhere else. And so through this series, what we're going to be doing is looking at the various jewels of our crowns that make up our identity. We're going to see who Jesus is, we're going to see who we are, and we're going to see who we are called to be in this world that we are called to be like Jesus. Now, I I really believe that we are stepping into a now season, and I know from personal experience and from walking with many of you that it has not felt that way. It has not felt like a now season. But I do feel like we're stepping into the kingdom here and now, not the kingdom delayed, but the kingdom here and now. And that it is time to step into our identity and our purpose. To tear down some lies. To take back our identity, which the the enemy has stolen from so many of us. And to stand in the truth of who we are. I do believe it is time. Now, I just want to quickly tell you about this watch. Just for a minute or two. Um, Now, 
keep in mind, I had already kind of crafted this sermon and made this series before this ever happened. So this is not manufactured. It is, I feel like it's from God. So Jeff gave me this watch. Um, I think I was pregnant with Eyeless, and she's 13 now, so a while ago. And I actually had asked for this watch. Um, I said I want it to be silver and gold. And that was, a, that was when we were living in a season where buying this wouldn't have been a sacrifice. Um, so Jeff bought me a watch for my birthday. And I loved it, and I wore it all the time. And then I kind of, you know, life just happened, and I stopped wearing it. And I felt like maybe it's just too flashy for me. Maybe it's a bit heavy for me. And so I put it down. And then a couple weeks ago, I, I saw it in my jewelry box. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to start wearing that again because it's a gift from my husband. And I want to honor that. And also, I like the watch. I think it's really pretty. And so I go to put it on and wear it, but it doesn't work. And so I start to kind of research this watch and find out about it, and it, it, it turns out it's a motion-powered watch. You know the kind of watches that don't work unless you wear them? <laughs> and so I'm like, shoot, I mean, it stopped working because I haven't lived in it. And so now I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta put this thing on. I got to live in it day in and day out for it to work, for it to have power. And so I feel like some of us have taken our crowns off and we have forgotten about them. And we have forgotten who we are. And we're not wearing them for the purpose of, you know, bringing the kingdom, right? We're just like, oh yeah, you know, I'll just put this over there. It doesn't really, I mean, whatever. There's not much to it. And then so anyway, I'm like, okay, I gotta get this thing going. So I researched that and it turns out that, and I am not joking, that I have to turn the crown. This thing here on the side of the watch is called a crown. And it's called that because it used to be on top of the pocket watch. And so now I gotta turn this crown over and over again. I gotta like recalibrate my watch to get it working. And so maybe I think through this series, some of us are gonna have a recalibration. Maybe just um, putting the crown back on or turning it, adjusting it. I feel like that is what God is gonna do through this series. And that in community, that's something that we do for each other as well. We actually call out our real identity in one another. So I'll say again, I'm excited about this series. And um, I, just, I believe in the power and the love of God and his purposes for us to know who we are and to take ground that the enemy has, has taken in our lives. So I'm going to pray for us, and then Trudy's going to come up and lead some ministry time. So Lord, we, we thank you and we praise you. King of kings and Lord of lords, we praise you and we bow down. And we thank you for this undeserved honor of the crown that you've given us. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and you would come in power in this series and, and break off the lies and break the strongholds that are in our hearts, Lord, and that you would come and renew our minds, transforming us and revealing to us who we are in you. And that we would begin to step into it and walk in it and see your kingdom here and now. I thank you for your goodness and your power.